And we're on. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 43 of the Technology for Good show. We have uh, two guests on the show today. Uh, Chris, who's a semi-regular host. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, Chris Kernahan. I am a cloud architect and uh, SAP mentor. And uh, as Tom said, I'm a semi-regular guest. So thank you very much for having me back, Tom. No problem. And Mike, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Mike Balin, and I am here in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. And uh, I currently focus on managing bank technology implementations all over the United States, um, remotely from here in Boston, and have been involved in uh, sustainability for a number of years, um, both previous jobs and uh, and and outside of my current job today. Mike, yeah, we, I, or at least I, I got to know you when you worked with StreamServe and you were in kind of document management and StreamServe were bought out. And it, the, the, the uh, financial industry now, it, it's, not, uh, it's not one that people would immediately associate with, with sustainability, uh, except right. when you look at perhaps some of the movements around divesting fossil fuels and that kind of thing. Is, 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 there, any, is there anything that you're seeing in, in, that, in the financial markets that uh, works towards sustainability? Uh, yeah, I see a, a few things, and um, so so the previous company I was with, you mentioned StreamServe, and that's now uh, a division of OpenText. Um, their focus was to take high-volume print production, so if you think of uh, all the utility bills, uh, folks like Citibank, uh, in banking, uh, NSTAR, and so on, all that stuff being printed out. Um, so, so one aspect of it was to look and say, gee, we can as achieve efficiencies by streamlining, simplifying, consolidating. Uh, there's an economic benefit to that. And, and what um, the company focused on was saying, let's quantify both the economic impact, but while we're at it, whether and, and frankly, whether you care or not necessarily, because sometimes those early conversations, the people on the other side of the table didn't really care focus on the sustainability aspect, uh, there are environmental benefits such as uh, reduced impact in CO2 emissions and then translating that to other things. Um, the second area was also being able to do substitution. So instead of physically getting you a paper invoice or bill easier with less environmental impact, there was also what about sending it electronically as yeah. an example. And then again, quantifying the financial as well as the sustainability benefits of that. Um, I'm, I'm looking guessing at, most of the people you were talking to were more interested in the financial impact as opposed to the sustainability impact. That's correct, and, and I would say that um, early on, we're talking in the late 2000s, uh, 2008, 2007 or so, um, when you and I first started working together, I think it was even further back a bit, um, the there was definitely um, more, I would say, a, a marketing slant to that yeah. early on, and then people were able to see, oh, you know, wow, a lot of the customers, the end customers, uh, this means a lot to them. And, and so this, you saw some very positive uh, synergistic effects. Um, if I look at today, um, so, so one example is uh, what part of financial services can you bring about the biggest gains? Um, I, for example, today look more on the corporate side of the business where a lot of that has been electronic for a long time. So there the reductions do look at data centers and some of the, the more um, uh, typical expected things. Um, I have heard of institutions where they would tie um, interest rates, for example, in terms of the kind of mortgage rates you get um, to environmental gains and impacts as well. Uh, if you, you, for example, have uh, metering on your electric, you know, for the washer and dryer and so on, mm -hmm. uh, which we have for our hot water, as an example, you might get, you know, some fraction of a point uh, benefit because it's cheaper for everybody involved and, and you do good again, but with a financial incentive. Nice. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, we've we've got a comment on the uh, the tweet stream, and uh, I just I just call it out in a second. But before I do, uh, for anyone who is watching and you do want to leave a comment, the hashtag is hashtag Tech for Good. So if you leave a comment there, we'll we'll see it on the in the tweet stream and uh, possibly call it out. So uh, Tammy Paulus, who's a, a regular watcher, uh, says that. 
uh, Chris, you are the Ed McMahon to my being the host. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he retired not that long ago, if I remember correctly. I wonder is there a hidden message there, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> That I'm the handsome one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> With this jumper, how can I lose? <laughs> <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. We'll we'll break into the stories, guys, uh, and uh, we, we'll we'll kick off. We have a ton of stories to get through. We're going to get through about a third of them, I reckon, the rate we're going. <laughs> but we'll we'll try anyway. Blame uh, the so new guy. Blame the new guy. We did blame it. The <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the first, the first story, and the, there's two climate stories this week. We we normally start with kind of the, the the bad news, and oh, I can see I've the I've, I've brought up the the wrong screen. Hang on there. Let's stop this and reverse. Uh, what watch what I'm watch what I'm doing there, yep. and that's better. Okay, cool. So. The, we're starting, as we always do, with climate-based uh, stories. And normally we do one, but there was two this week that I thought uh, would be reasonably interesting. And I, this is always the, the, the downer part of the show where we get the bad news and then we break out of bad news and just do good news from there on out. So the two bad news stories that I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about this week is this first one where this huge, huge study uh, on, the on the Greenland ice sheet shows uh, uh, that the ice the ice sheet in Greenland is disappearing, and you know, there's nothing really uh, surprising about that. We, we've we've kind of we we would have guessed that anyway. I, I guess is is the the takeaway from that. It's more confirmation of of what we've seen already. Uh, it's it's like I say, it's the bad news part of the show. So it's the bad news stories. Uh, the second one, uh, <clears throat> and again. No huge surprise here. NASA satellites are measuring the increase in sun's energy absorbed in the Arctic, and basically what that is is that because the Arctic is floating ice on top of water, there's no land mass underneath it, as the ice melts, you get the water underneath absorbing the heat that the ice would have reflected. It's called the albedo effect. Uh, and with the decreasing ice there, there's less albedo effect, so the the warmth from the sun, instead of being reflected, taken in by the water, the water heats up, etc. You get uh, feedback effects and so on. So uh, those those are the two bad news stories, and we'll move off those quickly because there's not really much to say there except that you know, oh crap, here we go again. So we'll, we'll break into some good news instead. And the first one I saw there that was interesting was that the US could easily power itself 100 times over with just solar power. And this is a study done uh, looking at uh, various, uh, well, lo looking, looking at the states in the US and the amount of solar energy that they can create. Uh, and how much it would take, and looking at rooftop uh, as well, rooftop solar, and ba basically the bottom line is there that you know with solar alone you could power the U.S. Now it's a bit more nuanced than that, and you'd have to have a lot of interstate stuff going on, but this is a really good story, and it it, it talks to it. it it, it, it's an upbeat story talking about renewables and how they can help with the US and uh, sticking with solar for a second a slightly different tack on that was this second story I saw uh, and this is this is a a, a crowd uh, a crowdfunding story but it's one on how a small scale solar desalination system is looking to set up water independence and this is this this device you see in the picture here has been prototyped uh, it's solar powered and underneath it as well you've got a way of uh, cleaning filtering and desalinating water using the solar power so you and you have a battery there as well and an LCD display so this is a little portable device which can take uh, dirty water or salt water clean it up, desalinate it, gives about 15 litres of water per day and runs off its own power if there's enough uh, sunlight. So you can imagine it going to places in uh, de the developing world where water is a serious issue uh, and it's not that expensive. 
so it, it seems like a really, really interesting story. And the last one, not quite on renewables, is one I'm going to throw at Chris, seeing as he, he brought this link in, and it's one about how uh, nuclear power is going to save the planet. So <laughs> with, 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 with <laughs> <laughs> I just said I'd love that little bomb at you there, Chris. <laughs> Considering I've already embarrassed myself about 30 seconds ago with a, 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 a burst of sound from my speakers, on the, which I have to apologize for. So, yeah, so um, it, it's something that I've seen a number of times coming backwards and forwards is the idea of nuclear um, working with generation reactors in, as a complement to renewables and the use of thorium reactors. I know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did fund them up the last time I checked was the middle of this year. Um, that may have changed since, but certainly the, the idea is to sort of bury one megawatt uh, thorium reactors in the ground uh, near population centers in developing nations and provide them with a, uh, an electricity supply that, that is, a, uh, that, that is uh, carbon neutral in, in many respects. Um, and reliable um, cheap. Mm. So I, I don't know how far they've gotten in terms of the deployment of them or, or whatever. But it, it, it it's I, I think it's an interesting one. You know, th th thorium was 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 one of those technologies that was very much in the forefront in the nineteen the late forties early fifties, and then the Cold War kicked off, and they went with plutonium and uranium because that jived with that that had synergies with the weapons programs and they abandoned mm -hmm. thorium because it was it couldn't be used for nuclear weapons deployment so uh it's nice to see it getting back in there but ultimately like you tom i'm conflicted by nuclear i i, I yeah. see that i see the promise of it but at the end of the day somebody has to pay the price and it's who pays it and when we pay it yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so two, two things, Chris. The, the first is, I, I think in the uh, scrabble under their headphone there, you're after putting your microphone at the back of your head, so you, you've gone a lot quieter than you were, which you know might not be a bad thing. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I just moved it so that it's so. Yeah. At least it didn't near my ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, as, 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 as you're saying, yeah. The, the whole nuclear thing is, is a very complicated one. Yeah. Um, I'm no big fan of nuclear, but I do see that it has a part to play, uh, given that it has a very low carbon footprint over the full life cycle analysis of, of nuclear. It, it has a very high uh, radioactive footprint, but yeah. um, the, the decommissioning of nuclear power plants is, is, is always problematic. Yeah. Um, and I, I was in, reading uh, just an interesting article a while back that says, so what if you fast forward 10,000, 20,000 years, how do we convey that information to our descendants that there might have been an area that's decommissioned? Um, and, and so among other ideas was, was storytelling and legends. And you think about some of the things like wow. the, the creation myths, you know, yes. that we have in our own legend. So just fuel for thought, so to speak. How can you pass it on if, let's say, language, technology, all that stuff goes away, potentially? Hang, hang on, hang on a second. No, Mike, you're not saying that creation is a myth, are you? Oh no! <laughs> oh no! no, no, no. <laughs> Shoot! It's live. We can't edit that out. Oh well. <laughs> oh, we're not getting it. Please, no, no. no. Let, let's not let let us not forget what happened with the interview this week. This is a can of worms we do not need to get into at no. all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, no problem. <laughs> Can I just remind the, the, the two points you made around the climate stories while yeah. I was broadcasting music there rather uh, rudely? Um, it always amazes me how big Greenland actually is. It never ceases to astound me when I look Huge, at, the map yeah. at how big it is. And I, I, you, it's you, about sixty percent yeah. the size of the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and when you when you think about that, it absolutely blows your mind as to you know the amount of ice that's actually stored there. And then the other thing that I find so some some of the ice there is about three kilometers deep. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, 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 you literally can't comprehend that at all. The other thing is, is, you know, in the story that you were looking at, it says it's going to raise sea levels by twenty feet, and that 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 in itself is just a depth, but it doesn't 
deal with how far it will encroach into my land. land. Yeah. So when you say 20 feet and people go, oh yeah, it's just 20 feet, but when you actually say, yeah, it'll be 20 feet up, but it'll actually encroach mm -hmm. three or four kilometers inland, people yeah. wake up and go, ah, right, okay, that, that, that's, that's my house. Like, yeah, that is your house. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It, 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 I'm, I'm about an hour from the coast here in Seville. Mm. But, you know, I could be half an hour from the coast in... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I could have some nice beachfront property in... in... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it is. It's it, it's 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 drastic. It really is. It's 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 scary. Um, it's. I mean, you you're looking at uh, eighty years time potentially for some of this stuff. I mean, the Greenland ice sheet, uh, it's melting, but it's it's not going to be a sudden melt. Um, yeah. But you know, it's it's the the sea level. Uh, I've forgotten the numbers. I, I want to say about four millimeters per year hmm. since the year nineteen hundred. Roughly, it's increased. Yeah. That's a lot. That That's is actually true. a lot. And you know, it's it's that that number is getting higher. Uh, and it it is actually it's uneven, uh, which is weird. Uh, I don't get that. <clears throat> um, if you look at the if you the 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 gravity satellite, the one that with the ion drive that dipped in and out of the Earth's atmosphere, when you actually look at the gravity map, you can see very clearly where there are. Levels of higher density and, and, and more gravity coming in. So whenever you, I think they factored in the sea level rises and find there's a pretty close correlation between where there is more gravity and and, and with sea, sea level rise. So okay. It was, there was an interesting one that came out. I think it was MIT did the uh, did the analysis. Wow. Okay. We'll move on because uh, because we should because we have a ton of stories to get through and uh, yeah the the next one that I saw that was interesting uh, is kind of from healthcare and it was uh, IBM uh, using their uh, AI their artificial intelligence machine Watson or technologies yeah. uh, to help with skin cancer um, uh, diagnosis basically. Uh, so there, there have been, <clears throat> excuse me, there have been over the last number of years, uh, with the proliferation of iPhone apps and Android apps and things like that, smartphone apps, which you take a picture of, you know, a mole that you're suspicious of, and it'll say, you know, w with a certain amount of um, uh, significant error margin, one has to imagine, but it'll basically say, look, go and see a dermatologist. But what this is, is this is something for the likes of dermatologists to use to aid them with diagnoses. And their diagnoses at the moment come in between 75 and 84% uh, accurate. Whereas they're saying that the uh, Watson one is going to come in at around 95%, which, you know, is, is, is a nice step up from that. Yeah. So um, it's... The... the the whole, the whole, uh, the whole um, AI field, with the, the and and the movement into uh, health of technology, which has started to happen in in earnest in the last eighteen months. I want to say maybe two years. Uh, we've got the likes of the uh, genomics uh, applications that are coming out of uh, SAP and IBM. Uh, Google are getting into the space as well. I, I would say those are the three big um, AI players in the e-health market at the moment. Um, and the, the applications that they're coming up with separately and independently are fascinating and they're going to really, really change, uh, I think, uh, how medicine is done in the next two, three years, ten years. I mean, uh, medicine as we know it today, uh, I, I, I won't say it'll be unrecognizable, but in, in five to ten years' time, it's going to change enormously. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that, too. I, I think, um, you know, the, I, I saw some glimmers of that back in the early 90s when I was living in Japan, and they had sensors on the, on it, on the toilet seats, of all things, um, to do some remote diagnostics and tracking. And I don't want to know what those remote diagnostics and tracking No! <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, you're the Ed McMahon, and I'm I'm Doc Severinsen. You know, all the jokes for both of you guys. <laughs> um, 
But but you know, fast forwarding, kidding aside, um, you know, there's so much power that looks like it'll be unleashed. But uh, back to I, I know some of what you've talked about earlier, Chris, with privacy before we went on air live. Uh, thoughts that you guys might have on, on addressing uh, some of those privacy concerns now. Well, for, from from my point of view, I think the 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 a lot of these apps or a lot of these things are. They're, they're, they're not necessarily going to affect the younger generation who are more okay with their privacy and, and sharing of their data, either in structured or unstructured formats. It is literally aimed at people like ourselves who are you know, leaving our 30s, going into our 40s and beyond, and you know, possibly requiring more... Uh, more well, we, we want to stay healthier and live for longer, so... Yeah, I wish I was leaving my 30s and going into my 40s. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I'm, it's been, it's I'm, been a while. I'm, obviously, <laughs> I'm speaking for myself here then. My early well. 30s. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it, it will require a, a, a cultural shift in, in our generation in order to take advantage of these things. You know, even if, if you look at the, the cancer diagnosis, the cancer app, you know, at the end of the day, cancer is a progressive disease and you can only really track it in terms of what it was like at one day and what it was like another day so if you wish to increase the accuracy rates you need more data and more shots uh, more, more slice more time slices to get a better view so it will require a cultural shift in how we view our privacy and our data in order to fully unlock those medical advances yeah. my two cents mm. It'll, it'll require a shift on the part of medics as well, who uh, haven't been very technology savvy, really. Yeah. Uh, you still see them going around with clipboards and paper. <clears throat> hmm. And by, by the way, we've had a correction come in over Twitter there from Sandy Kelmsley, who tells me that Greenland is not 60% of, uh, of the size of the US. It's uh, about 25%. Uh, oh. According to Wikipedia, she says it's 2 million kilometers squared versus 9 million kilometers squared. So I was I was taking uh, the, the numbers from the article, if I remember correctly. It, there was a video in the article which overlaid the size of Greenland on, onto the U.S. And it, I, I, I thought it said 60%, but I'm, I, I may have been wrong. It's, it's happened before. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry about it. But it, it, it's still the <coughs> fact that it is huge. Yeah. massive because it's because what 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 what's the type of map you know or the typical atlas map the mercator the mercator uh, projection projection it, it vastly distorts the size of, of various countries in the world and when you actually look at it on Google Earth or something like that it is phenomenal yeah so, yeah I mean, it, it, it compresses the northern latitudes so yeah Greenland does appear smaller yeah okay so uh, the the sticking with health, uh, there was an interesting story I saw <clears throat> over on on. Okay, it, it was Mashable, but hey, you know, <laughs> you, you know what's Mashable? It's going to be a clickbait story, and sure enough, it's the typical uh, formula: five digital health trends that you'll see in 2015. Is this, um, and is this like the Daily Mail of of the web? There are a number of daily mails of the web, including the Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, is, 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 is the answer to that. Uh, but the, uh, there were one or two things to take away. I mean, it, it, it's mashable, as I say, so you, you take it with a bucket of salt. Uh, but the, the, the five things that they talked about, and they missed a few, I would say, wearables for the ear. And yep. This basically talks about building sensors into earbuds. So yeah, that that's going to happen. <clears throat> Sweat sensor strips. So that's yeah. I don't know. Um, it, it, the well, idea I'm... the idea is that you'd wear these sensors uh, on places that you'd be likely to sweat. They'd analyze and and, and feedback info. So so all, all you would need is one good curry, and then your data set's completely gone. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> there well, you go. Now, now I'm intrigued. Do people sweat from their ears? Because then you can have dual purpose <laughs> earbuds too. But <laughs> for another time. <laughs> yeah. There's smart co smartphone case devices. So the idea that you know you could have sensors built into the smartphones. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting one. Prescription only apps. So these are apps that uh, give you prescriptive advice and consequently are only available themselves on prescription. Not sure how you'd f show the prescription to the app store so that you could download it, but I don't know. 
I, um, I can see I, I, I can see some of those being heavily regulated. Yeah. And then there's last one which they kind of shoehorned in there because they had to make up five. And it's healthier lighting. It's, <clears throat> uh, you know, basically what they're saying there is that the lighting that are on the kind of screens that we have uh, contain a lot of blue light, which, which uh, tend to make us less sleepy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in, in the future, we'll have less blue lights on our screens and we'll all be a lot healthier as a result. Uh, as I say, they, they shoehorned it in there because five sounds a lot better than four trends yeah. to look for in 2015. But, the, yeah, the, I, I, the, there was one or two interesting things in there. The, the sweat strips would be interesting to see if that happens. Uh, they missed a couple of ones as well, as I say, the kind of things we were talking about earlier. Um, the earbud ones is a possibility, all right, because I can see some people being more likely to wear earbuds with sensors rather than something like this if they don't think the uh, the likes of the Force or the smart watches with sensors look particularly fashionable. Uh, then maybe if they have ones built into the ear, I mean, people go jogging all the time with earbuds in, you know, it, it's a lot less of a thing uh, to be wearing earbuds with sensors. You could build them in the earrings, you could build them in the, you know, all, all sorts of things. So, yeah, it's... Uh... There, 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 there are many, many possibilities there. Uh huh. Uh, hang on, we've got a couple of more comments coming in. Sandy's talking about the. Uh, they may have used a Mercator projection. Yeah, yeah. So that which makes the north and south look much bigger. So what Sandy's saying there is that in the video that I saw about Greenland, they may have just taken the Mercator projection and overlaid it rather than the actual size. So maybe that's why. Yeah. Okay. And and Michael Koch is just. Uh, or, or quoting what I said about uh, the Daily Mail, maybe several Daily Mails. <clears throat> in, 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 indeed, there are. <laughs> yeah. So we'll 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 press on. Uh, so the next one I saw, we're going to the IoT space now, mm. and the uh, Wemo Maker. So <clears throat> we've talked about Wemo, which is a a Belkin brand. Yes. Before on the show. And I have a couple of Wemo devices. And in fact, I published a video last year, this time last year, uh, of a Wemo um, smart plug or smart outlet, I guess, power outlet. Mm. So basically, it was a power outlet that you, uh, you you plug into a normal outlet, and it makes the outlet a smart outlet. So the the, the outlet then uh, is is connected via Wi-Fi. <clears throat> And uh, you can connect to it over Wi-Fi or over 3G because it connects to your Wi-Fi network. Uh, and you can control the outlet either over 3G or over Wi-Fi. So I plugged my Christmas tree into it last year and recorded a video of my controlling the lights on my Christmas tree using my smartphone, using both the Wi-Fi and turning the Wi-Fi off the phone and then subsequently controlling the lights using the 3G network. So you could control it from anywhere, basically, was what I was showing there. But what this device is, this is, again, part of the, the Belkin Wemo brand. And this device is one where you don't have a physical switch per se. And it's for devices. And the use case they have in this review <clears throat> is garage openers. Oh, so, yes. Because you don't have a switch for a garage opener. It's one that you have a little radio button uh, mounted typically on the, on, on, the, on the sunscreen on your car or one of these things. Uh, the the what's that thing that you know they pull down to block the sun? visor yeah visor thank you there you go I'd lost the word so on the visor of your car and what what this one is in, is a little device that you wire your uh, uh, garage opener through and they you know it's it's not difficult to do uh, they they show a cutaway of it here so you, you know ah, you've got yes. sensors and relays you just w plug the wires in and out mm -hmm. uh, and you can control it then from your smartphone. So, and you can see the status of it via your smartphone as well. So if you're at work, you can pull it out. Look, did I close the garage door or not? Oops, I left the garage door open. Press the button, bang, door closes. Mm. And, you know, you can, in, in reverse as well, okay, I'm on my way home, two minutes from home, press the button, door opens. L less likely to be useful because, you know, you've got the thing on the visor anyway. But yeah. the uh, being able to check remotely, and that's just that's just one of the use cases of it. So you know, this is just is just extending <clears throat> uh, the 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 IoT and the connected homes 
idea. And staying with the IoT space, there was another story there that I thought was interesting as well, and it was the uh, tile, a uh, little Bluetooth tracker. And the, the tiles are these kind of white squares with the cutout circle in the middle of them there. They include uh, uh, little Bluetooth radios, uh, GPS radios, uh, and a little, a little uh, sounder as well to make noise. So you can you know, put them on key rings and stuff like that. Uh, and like I say, they, 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 they've uh, Bluetooth and uh, GPS, so you can find things that you lose as long as they have these little tiles on them. They were released, uh, they, they raised nearly $2.7 million uh, using crowdfunding uh, last year or early this year. It was last year, there it goes. One of the biggest crowdfunded successes ever. Uh, and at the time, it was iOS only. Uh, and the, 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 this story is basically now they've gone beyond iOS only, and for the first time they've come out with uh, Android as well. So uh, it, it's, it's a nice, cute little connected story, uh, along with the, the, the Wemo one as well. So we, we've got a, you know, the, this whole IoT connected devices uh, thing, everything starting to be connected, sensors dropping in price all the time. Uh, I'm I'm always conflicted, especially about things like the uh, you know, the, the Bluetooth tracker. You know, there, there's a part of me that says, look, just keep an eye on your stuff. Yeah, but you um, know, if you, you you might want to staple one to your son's or daughter's forehead, for example. Well, this this is this. this <laughs> you know, I, I have to admit, actually, I do see a massive thing like when you're traveling. Okay, putting putting stuff on the, your your backpack or you know, uh, or on your child. Absolutely, I can see that 100%. For stuff in my house, if I don't know where it is, then you know I should really go looking for it or find a place for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so which is usually the floor. But, uh, but yeah, I, I do. I, I see. I this is one of the reasons why it conflicts. Looking, me. looking behind you there, Chris. I, 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 there's no chance anything would ever get lost in your place. <laughs> 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 although although but, I'm, I'm, I'm horrifically anal when I travel. I mean, seriously, there, there, is, a po there is a pocket for everything and everything I'm the same. in its pocket. So, so you know, if I'm going through airport security, I, I know exactly in what pocket everything is in. Yeah. Uh, when I have a pocket for my wallet and my passport, so when I get out the tube, I can pat and know where everything everything's there Yeah. So I can go on with my day. Yeah, no, I, I'm exactly the same. I, I, I know my, my liquids are always in this little clear plastic bag in the same place. My laptop's always in the same place. Yep. Uh, my, my, my phone's always in the same pocket. And the wallet, as you say, and the passport, all in separate, but, but all in separate pockets, but always in the same ones. Yeah, exactly. So I, and, and keys as well. So I always know where everything is. And when I get home from a trip, I haven't used the keys in two, three, four days, whatever it is. Yep. So they're always in the same top pocket in my bag. So as soon as I get you know home, Open the top pocket, whip out the keys, and I'm off. Yeah, I could. So, I, I, so I could be wearing odd socks the entire way through. My yeah. I, I will know where everything else is. So, you know, I couldn't dress myself, but I'll know where everything is. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, I, I cut across you there. Oh, that's okay, Chris. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just curious. Um, you know, here the the Nest thermostat is very popular in the U.S. Is it also popular over in Europe, where you guys are? It, it's getting to be, and in fact, you, you're, you're leading us in nicely to our next story, uh, which is about the, the Nest. Uh, let, let me pull that up on screen, and we can bring the two things together. So sure. um, the, the next story is that uh, Google for Android and iOS have now been, the, the, that's the Google application for Android and the Google application for iOS have now been updated with Nest integration. So now in your Google application on your iPhone or your Android device, you can say to it, set the temperature to you know, 23 or 24 degrees and centigrade or 17 Fahrenheit and it'll talk to Nest and do it for you. So if you're too lazy to get your ass off the chair and go up and turn the dial on your thermostat, you can do it from, you know, or I, I, I'm being facetious. Obviously, you can also do it, uh, you know, while you're away from home. Uh, and so. and I I will share with you just a, a slight geekiness factor on my part. I I in fact did um, 
do that, try it out, and it worked beautifully. And it, it's one of the Google cards that comes up. So with Google Now, and it shows a little rendering of the nest, and and also uh, the color turns orange to show that it's heating. If you say set my temperature to, I'll say Fahrenheit because it's been a while since I lived in Europe, <laughs> 65 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so nice. a little hint of things to come. It's it's, That's it's very cool. cool. That is very cool. And you you were asking if they're popular over here. Um, it it depends. Um, they're not popular in Spain because they haven't really been put on sale in Spain. Mm. But for example, I know that in Ireland, uh, two three weeks ago, uh, the predominant uh, utility company in the Republic of Ireland is called Electric Ireland, the former ESB, the former monopoly company, mm -hmm. and they it, it's now become a very competitive market. And uh, the Electric Ireland. Uh, put an offer out, and we, we reported it on this show, that they would give a free Nest thermostat to anyone who signed up with them for a two-year contract. So even if you were an existing customer and you signed a two-year contract, you got a free Nest. Uh, if you weren't an existing customer and switched over to them for a two-year contract, you got a free Nest. Um, and I was talking to a guy from a company called AccuFlow, who are a water management company. And he was telling me that the reasoning behind this is very simple. <coughs> Sorry, bit of a cough here, cold disappearing off after a nasty week. But he was saying that um, the reason or the way they're able to do this is they get carbon credits off the back of the um, nests. So while the nests may be costing them, I don't know, I want to say 150 euros maybe if they buy in bulk. Okay. Uh, if it's costing them 150 euros, they're probably going to get back 300 euros per nest in carbon credits over the lifetime of the nest. Oh, that's plus, interesting. They, yeah. plus they get a customer for two years. And this guy from AccuFlow is telling me this because he's going to do something similar for social and council housing in the UK, uh, where he's going to be selling them smart water valves at about 70 pounds UK per water valve delivered and installed, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And these water valves are going to save about 400 uh, pounds over their lifetime in carbon credits. So while the initial outlay is, as I say, 70 pounds per valve, they will save the councils and the social housing organizations 400 per device. So it's, a, it's, it's an incredibly interesting model. And with mm -hmm. that in mind, I can see far more utilities and far more housing organizations and the likes uh, and even maybe maybe that could be a key into the landlord market, which is a very fragmented market and very hard to regulate because you know yeah. uh, it, it's not in a landlord's interest at the moment to uh, put in efficient devices in their houses, and it's not in the tenants either because they don't own. So that that's one that has always been problematic, but maybe models like this would be ones that would push that needle. So, so there, there is one other. I'm sorry, because I was just going to mention there. There is one other aspect that's that's interesting uh, in terms of how the Nest has been deployed. So I'm speaking as more from the point of view of the the end user of the system. Uh, they've introduced gamification. So you have your little credits that say, "Oh, I'm in the X percentile per day," and you get a little leaf. And so naturally, even though there's no monetary gain to the user, mm -hmm. although why not over time introduce that that say, okay, I've accumulated 25 leaves this month out of 31, um, and sure, give me a 10% break on next month's bill. You know, yeah. that, that could be also part of the metric there. Yeah. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. Uh, I didn't mean to there, interrupt. There two, two points. I, uh, it wasn't until I actually found somebody who had installed the Nest, because you know, in, in the UK, we don't tend to have thermostats. We, we have heating timers. So mm. um, one of the things that always put me off about the Nest was actually the installation of the thermostat, not necessarily the border controller. So um, it was a lack of understanding there of how the Nest actually is deployed. And the website still doesn't break that out to any great degree of detail. Um, the other thing was that British Gas, like ESB or uh, Electricity Ireland, they have teamed up with Honeywell with the Hive to do a similar promotion, but they were actually fined in the last quarter by the British government for not meeting their renewables targets because the uptake on that deal with the Hive was so low. 
So it was the 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 the, the hive deal was was so poorly uh, received by the market. So it was so. Well, you know, it doesn't always work out. Yeah. Which yeah. is a, which is a pity. It's a pity, yeah, yeah. We, we've got a couple of more comments coming in on the tweet stream. So <clears throat> Michael Kletzas, who is a a good friend of Red Monks and based out of Hawaii, uh, is watching the show, and uh, he is saying if you can track it, and he's talking about the uh, home uh, IoT stuff, uh, home, home area networks, he's saying if you can track it, uh, hacking will occur. Uh, he's saying others can too, so home hacking is going to be... a or, or cracking maybe is, is going to be something we'll see in the future. Mm. And uh, the the kind of uh, packing that we were talking about, Chris, you and I, and uh, pockets for, for different devices, uh, Michael Koch was saying that uh, pickpockets are going to love this. So uh, we, we, <laughs> we got to watch ourselves there. <laughs> true, true. Uh, we, we didn't say which pockets, though, Michael, so yeah. I, I, I think we're some way safe on that one. All right, we'll move on. So uh, next thing, Google. We were talking about Google with their Nest device. The next story out of Google I saw that I thought was interesting was that Gmail uh, has been upgraded, uh, as, as they regularly do with, with uh, Gmail, or with, with uh, Drive in this case, sorry. Drive has been upgraded uh, to allow uh, attachment capabilities, open dock format support, and a couple of other things as well. <clears throat> so, and you, you can see it here. In this screenshot, uh, when you're doing an insert file uh, using Google Drive, you get the option to do the Drive link or attach it as an actual attachment, which you didn't have before. Yeah. If it's in Drive, so that that's pretty nice. Uh, and the other thing that they talked about was the Open Doc format. And what that is is the uh, if if you're on Linux and you don't want to use Microsoft Office, there's this Open Office application uh, which is quite good. <clears throat> I haven't used it in a while, but it's it's got these ODF formats and things like that. But uh, Google didn't recognize those until now, uh, and now Drive does recognize those and will allow you to use those in the same way you can use Office formats uh, within um, Drive. So kudos to Google for doing that. The other interesting story I saw, and this kind of brings us more into the kind of security space uh, coming out of Google, was that they have now put an encryption plugin for Gmail, and they've dumped it into GitHub. So uh, it, it, it's going to be a Chrome plugin uh, for Gmail. Uh, it's, it's based on open PGP. Uh, so, I mean, PGP and open and PGP are standards that are extremely well known uh, and well trusted. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they're putting it on GitHub means that if they have made any uh, mess ups with the coding, it'll be found quickly enough. You'd have to hope. Yeah. Although you know we've seen how well that's gone with a couple of exploits that have come out this year. But anyway, it's an SSL, we three. won't. Yeah, we won't go down that rat hole. Um, but you know, this this can only be a good thing. You'd imagine uh, end to end decryption and. It's, it's a weird one coming out of Google, though, because they make their money out of reading your email, and if they're doing end-to-end mm. -end encryption, uh, what does that do to their ability to make money? It doesn't necessarily... Uh, it, it, it is... I think, I think the, at the end of the day, PGP encryption places an overhead on any activity that you're doing, and we all know that the lowest amount of friction wins more, than, more often than not, so... Will the white will encryption become a widespread adoption between you know for the granny test? At the mm. moment, I don't think so. So they are satisfying the the the, the noisemakers and clamorers to say you know we need encryption, we need privacy, and we need this and we need that, and they they they're, they're absolutely satisfying that need. At the same time, they they still you know they have a lot of bets in a lot of different industries. You know, I, I suspect that they won't always be an ad-driven company. Mm. So, you know, they, they, they must be sure enough of their ability to cope without AdWords in order to, to, to make money in some shape or form. So, but uh, I agree. Put a, putting it in GitHub, it does it put it makes it very transparent, and yeah. uh, you know, it, it that that can only be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you think? Any any thoughts on that, Mike? 
I, I totally agree with that as well. Yeah, I think uh, the, the transparency and, and just, um, you know, hopefully uh, they have other, I'm certain, not even hopefully, I know they have other venues where they will be able to continue to make their money, uh, although I am reading more and more about uh, the impact of mobile technologies on their core model. Uh, but that might be another conversation, Tom and Chris. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll plow on. <clears throat> And I saw, this is an interesting one, uh, Skype have a new app which translates speech in real time. And I've seen demos of it, it's done reasonably well. Uh, basically, you, you speak a sentence in one language, it then speaks it out in another language to whomever you're speaking to. <clears throat> so the, w one of the demos I saw was uh, you know, two people speaking to each other. One was an English language native and the other was a Spaniard. So I was able to listen in to this because I've a reasonably good Spanish at this point, uh, and the um, the translator made one mistake. The, the the Skype translation made one mistake, and that was, and it was an understandable mistake. Um, the mistake it made was that the Spaniard who was speaking uh, used the word Leo, which means I read, but Leo is also a name, Leo. Ah, yes. So mm. while, while she was speaking in Spanish, it mistranslated her saying she was going to read to uh, the name Leo. But, you know, and, and it, it translated it properly when she rephrased it afterwards. So, but it, it, it does. It does it in real time. And it's, for the moment, it's Windows 10 only, I think. Uh, but you have to assume with something like this, they're probably going to roll it out on all... Uh, Skype platforms the the way they the way that Microsoft recently have been rolling everything out on all platforms it's it's been transformational uh, it's been a huge transformation on their on their part uh, mm. so I'd be surprised if they don't do the same with this I I, I this is one of those stories that absolutely blew my mind I saw Rory Kettman Jones doing it on the BBC uh, uh, it it one it it shows uh, Microsoft research and, and, and product deployment in a brilliant, brilliant light. I'm a huge fan of Microsoft research, have been for many, many years. Um, some of the stuff they're doing is fantastic. But uh, I, I, I have to ask about the translation. In whose voice does the translation actually appear as? So uh, they, I think they have um, a number of, you know, yeah. Uh, computer voices, the likes of the Siri voice or the Cortana voice, these kind of things. So um, I think you can choose to listen with a, a male or a female uh, voice. I... Yeah, and I, I had a chance to watch a, a video, the, the video I think you're talking about, Tom, and um, it was very interesting in part how they introduced something so novel to the mainstream. If, if you recall, it was gradually um, almost like a courtship across the two schools, one in Mexico, one in Seattle. And then, then gradually more and more of the techno voice took over to show you how it works. And uh, that struck me as very clever as a way yeah. to, to help ease that fear of the technophobia. And it, it, it's, it's, even, it's, it's more than that as well because you have to, you have to kind of get into the, the rhythm of it. It's, it's a slightly different way of conversing because you say something uh, and then the computer speaks it in the other language to the other participant mm -hmm. and then they reply and then the computer reply or translates their reply to you so you have to stop and listen more and you you know you, you it's it's you know it, it's it's a conversation which isn't as fluid yeah right as as a normal conversation would be and you just have to uh, yeah, you just have to stop and listen more, uh, and and be more patient. I think it would. Uh, I, I can I can see it having a lot of very interesting use cases. Um, well, back to medical diagnostics, for example, maybe just where you just want to get very precise information that might be very helpful to enhance some of the other technologies you spoke of today. You'd want to be very sure of it. Well, the the. If, if the slightest I'm... mistranslation, and you could get into serious. No, <laughs> oh, wrong leg. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Amputation. <laughs> oh. well, if, if you look at if you look at at, uh, at 
at some of the you know, if you look at the, the diversity of, of many of our, our our cities and stuff now and you know if you go to london for example there are more languages spoken in london than probably in, in many major cities in, the, in many places in the world so having a device like that where you're able actually to translate in real time in an a e department could be the difference between you know a serious uh, repercussions or just a, a, a minor ailment yeah, yeah, no, that, that's true. I mean, it's it's this is this this is the development of the Babelfish that Douglas Adams wrote about. Yes, yes, right. Like, you don't have to put it in your ear. When you <laughs> but yeah, it's not a goldfish. <laughs> Okay, we'll 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 power on. And I I saw this one. It's a bit of a trivial one, but uh, it, it struck me as quite cute. So, Andle, uh, it's Amazon. Amazon have got this uh, Kindle app for iOS. Hmm. Uh, they have it for Android as well, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, but they've updated it with uh, Goodreads integration uh, and Audible Progressive Play. Uh, and basically, um, so th there's a couple of things about that. <clears throat> The first is I don't have a Kindle, but I buy a lot of books through the Kindle store and I download them to my uh, my desktop, my laptop, my tablet, or my smartphone, and they sync across all those devices because I have the Kindle app on all those devices. Yep. So that that's really cute. Mm -hmm. uh, it means a I don't have to buy a Kindle, so it's one less physical device. So. Uh, and, and that's always good. Uh, and it's always synced, so no matter what device I'm reading on, I get to read and be up to date on whichever uh, book I happen to be reading at the time. Now, I use Goodreads, but only occasionally when I remember when I'm you know, on my tablet, because it happens to be on the front page of my tablet, because that's where it downloaded to, because there's space there when I download it, and I never get around to organizing it properly. So occasionally I'll, I'll go into Goodreads and I'll update it with whatever books I've read since the last time I've been into Goodreads and I don't do it all that often. But now, now that it's actually integrated into Kindle, it's much, much easier. Yeah. So now, you know, I'm, I'm within the Kindle app and it's one of the icons at the bottom of the screen. So I just press that and it automatically uh, pulls up the screen to say, I'm now 69% through this book. Gives me an option to uh, leave a comment there about the book if I want. Comment to or a, a, a chance to rate it if I want as well, and just hit submit and bang, in it goes to Goodreads. So, you know, uh, it, it makes for me it makes using Goodreads that much uh, more straightforward. It, it takes away a lot of the friction of having to open a separate app to do it. And you know, it, it's it's an obvious one that I'm surprised they didn't do ages ago, considering they bought Goodreads, you know, quite a while ago. And the the other part is the Audible. Um, the Audible Progressive Play means basically no matter which device you open up uh, your book on in, in Audible or within Kindle, uh, it now knows where you are within your book and starts reading from there. So same, same kind of idea. Yeah, I think the power of, of that is, um, you know, it sounds like you've had that experience as well, Tom, with, with Kindle and now broadening that. It's, it's, if, I don't know if TiVo is still available there um, in yeah. Europe, but uh, it's like the TiVo of your day. You can you can just kind of start something, then you go off. You have to do uh, prepare lunch or something. You can pick it up where you left off with whatever is the appropriate device that's around you. Um, yeah. It seems more and more prevalent. You'll see that. Absolutely, and it, it it's so handy. It's so. Chris, you were going to say. I I you know I I put off buying a Kindle for a long time. I I I, I have a large collection of books in the uh, in the, the other room there, floor to ceiling bookshelves, just round full of books. I absolutely yeah. <laughs> so if I, 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 I that's only one of them in in the room be, behind the wall here. I've it's it's all books as well. Yeah. So so I, I put up buying a Kindle for a long time because I, I really really love having books. I like the physicality of it, and then I bought a Kindle and I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I actually end up reading more because it is so frictionless. Mm. Um, but uh, the, the the thing. The, the I'm still very ambivalent around Amazon and what they're doing in the book market, and so yeah. integrations like this, I think, are good. But overall, I, I if it enhances people's experience and enable them to buy more and do more, I'm absolutely in favour of it. I, I look at my niece and my nephew, and they read all the time, and they love it as as, as you know, young children. Um, but um, 
yeah, if if it if it enhances people buying books and doesn't it doesn't enhance Amazon monopoly, then don't yes. screw the publisher. Yeah, but but at the same time, the economics are very poorly understood because we, we know about movies and we know on streaming, we know about music, but I haven't seen any really good economic papers on the literary ecosystem. And so, on the one hand, the consumer in me loves. The low friction of Amazon and Kindle, mm. the, uh, the 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 what is it the, the the conscientious buyer in me wants to make sure that that ecosystem is protected. And yeah, yeah. No, I'm the same. And I mean, I, I have huge problems with their cloud offerings, and I know I'm supporting them by buying books from them. So yeah. it, 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 there is that conflict there as well. But you yeah. know, in, in terms of eBooks, there are really only two uh, players in the market of any yeah. consequence. Exactly, and that, 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 that's a very that's a very per uh, economic model. Yeah. So it is so it it's as I said, I love Goodreads, I love Audible, I love all these things, I love my Kindle. I just I, I I'm bringing them closer together, which is friction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still it, I'm I'm still uneasy. Yeah. No. So so am I. And what what I hate in particular uh, as well about both players, both the uh, the iBooks and uh, the Kindle store, is the fact that they're both so heavily DRM'd. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I buy a book, physical book, uh, and I finish it and I hand it off to uh, whoever and, you know, if I never see it again, that's fine too, but I, I regularly give away books that I've read. Um, you know, that what, what's behind me there and in the other room is maybe a tenth of all the books I've ever bought. Yeah. Uh, because I, I all the time I'm, I'm giving books to people, uh, particularly the ones I really like. Do you not love me? Because <laughs> <laughs> since I met you, Chris, most of the books I bought have been in Kindle, and they won't let me. <laughs> and that's not true. I, I, I shared a, I shared a Dropbox folder with you with books yeah, in it. I, I, uh, you should take a look at it now. There's some pretty good stuff in there. But yes, you're right. DRM is a problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, there you go. We'll keep going. Uh, it's coming up to Christmas, and this is kind of the time of year when people might be thinking of new smartphones for themselves. And uh, I saw this site, uh, or this yeah, this site referred to on the Geek.com uh, website. And basically, this what what you have in this little graphic here is a screenshot of a a thing on. I don't know if you pronounce that Nod or Gnod or whatever, but it's a smartphone comparison chart. And basically, I'll open it up here. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's on things.nod.com, G-N-O-D, things.gnod.com. And basically, you've got uh, check boxes and sliders on the left-hand side here. And if you say, you know, if you tick the check box for the SD card, so the option to have an SD card in your phone, then the chart rearranges, showing you ones that, that have SD cards. You can put in dual SIM, and suddenly you get, these are the ones that have dual SIM. You can say, I want the phone to have, uh, you know, 9 gigs of memory, 50 gigs of memory, you know, or whatever. Just move those sliders along. Uh, your resolution... Uh, 183 PPI, 306 PPI, any of these things that are important to you, as you move them, the amount of uh, phones on screen changes and rearranges. The uh, axis on the left-hand side going up along is screen size. On the bottom is price. Left to right is more expensive on the right, less expensive on the left. As you mouse over any of the phones, it gives you details on those individual phones. The axes themselves you can change. It is screen size at the moment, but if you click on, uh, uh, say, memory, it changes to memory, or PPI, that's pixels per inch, or weight. You know, so you can, you can adjust as, as you wish. Uh, you can decide to go for different brands or not. You know, so it's a very, very uh, nice comparison, uh, interactive comparison. I hate the word interactive because it's been so misused, I guess. But this is a, a seriously good interactive chart for allowing you to uh, compare phones because there's so many in the market. Uh, mm. it's, it's impossible to know what does what. Um, I, I'm, I'm very... Uh, simple. So um, 
complex stuff scares the crap out of me. So I, I've stuck with the Apple ecosystem because they only bring out one or two phones. So it's very easy to choose in that case. So, yeah, Michael, I, I, you, you mentioned you, you'd look, you've been using Google now, so I assume you have an Android phone. I do, yeah. Which one have you got? Um, well, as of a, a week and a half ago, I have uh, something that's just here in the U.S., uh, specifically at Verizon, which is one of the big telco providers for wireless. Um, it's called the Droid Turbo. And uh, I, I will say uh, I... I I, I was able to winnow down my choice partly through um, a, a, an accident of sorts. My GPS stopped working when I was on a business trip, and I had to get to a destination. Um, so I'll share with you just that, uh, I, you know, I, I first uh, for five minutes was in a panic, like, my goodness, how am I going to find this place, and I'm late. Um, and then all of a sudden I realized, how did I survive my first 45 or so years? <laughs> how did you do this? Oh, yeah, you look on a map. <laughs> so I actually got there, and, and then just to compound things, the, um, the, there were several people who, in fact, were using Apple's, um, not the Google map, but the Apple version, and I don't want to disparage Apple at all. I think they're a great company and products, but uh, uh, the, the GPS uh, took them to the wrong location. So I was actually... Ooh one of the first ones to show up <laughs> uh, without technology. But, Excellent. Um, Excellent. but yeah, I've, I've generally personally, um, I, I think it's so much a matter of personal preference. I did have an iPhone for about three days, and I'm one of the four people in North America who took it back and, uh, yeah. and went Android. Um, so I, I think it's just really what suits you. Tom, you spoke of uh, simplicity, having two choices versus, you know, the 840 or so <laughs> that, that I had when I walked into the store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I've I've been in the Apple ecosystem since I uh, bought my first Mac in '89, um, and and during that time I've been a, a Windows sysadmin, uh, administering uh, large networks of Windows devices. Uh, I, I've uh, used Active Directory and SQL Server and Exchange. I've, I've configured all of those and ISA. Uh, firewalls and all that kind of stuff. So I know the whole ecosystem upside down, inside out. Um, and my son has an Android phone, so I know that ecosystem pretty well as well. But I'm 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 in I'm on the Apple side of the house. Just uh, it's easy. Uh, it generally works. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, I've I've quite a bit invested in this point or at this point in things like apps and music and stuff. It would be actually. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd have to dump a lot of that to move, as far as I know, and you know I don't see a good reason to move anyway. So I'm I'm well, happy. The 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 Android phones are good phones generally. Uh, the Apple phones are good phones generally. You know it's it's six of one half a dozen of the others. They say so. You know if there were a compelling reason to move, yeah, I'd consider it. But I don't see a compelling reason right now. Well, yeah. Chris, you 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 brought up specifically Google now, and and um, you know very interesting uh, as I noodle on that. I'd, um, I, I'm not so familiar with the world of Apple anymore, and Siri, of course, I've heard of, but um, the fact that they have these cards that, uh, depending on how many of your personal freedoms you're you're willing to click and give up, uh, they could do a fine job. Like, I have to pick my daughter up. Uh, she's flying in for Christmas this afternoon uh, from Chicago, and, uh, you know, it's front and center. I know exactly what time the, the flight is arriving and the status and the gate, et cetera. Um, oh. Just well, thoughts on that, the privacy trade-offs. I, I well, the, the so I, I, I moved when I when I joined SAP, I moved from Android back to Apple, and mm -hmm. in, in because the, the only phone that they had on offer really for for Android that was in any way sensible was the Galaxy S4, which I don't like as a handset. So I I went back to the Apple, and I, I have to say I thoroughly hated. It. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I just I, I, it took me about six months to get to like Android, and then I about six months after that I, I moved sorry eighteen months after, or about another year after that I moved back to Apple, and the level of restrictiveness of that walled garden. But I do think mm. that some of the services like Google Now is is so much better on on, on Android than, than on Apple. Um, but one of the ones that I actually I truly adore is Cortana. Mm. I went to uh, I went to uh, the Microsoft store when I was at TechEd in Las Vegas, and the guy showed me something that just blew my mind. Um, he did the usual thing, you know, who's Bill Gates married to, and what's his wife's name, and all the rest of it, and it gave us that from the Wikipedia entry. And then he asked Cortana who would win the next Bulls game. 
That was it. That, that was the question. So no context of date, no context of who they were playing or anything like that. And the answer came back and said, I think it, they will they will win again or they will win against the person that they're playing. And it gave a match analysis of an up, of the next upcoming match. Mm. And that just absolutely blew me away. The lack of context he provided and the specificity of the answer that he got back was absolutely amazing. And I haven't seen that on Siri and I haven't seen it on Google now. Wow. So we should all go out and get a Windows device and start betting no, heavily. No, 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 no. no. I, I, was just, <laughs> I was just remarking on it at that. that, what, that was Cortana right? Did you take note? Yes. yes. Well, I, I don't know if she knew about. I didn't know. I don't know if the the, the match result was quite what she predicted. But the the, the fact that it, she could establish what the next game was, when it was going to be, and punditry analysis was just an all that blew me away. But in mm. terms of the privacy stuff. <sighs> I don't know. It, it, it's 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 one of those ones that um, I don't really need people to know that I'm out of the house for three weeks when I'm on holiday. But you know, having if I'm going to use Google to use the maps and stuff like that, they know where I'm going, so they might as well have my diary as well. You know, so it it just it, it there's there's levels of things I'm willing to give up, and there's levels of things I'm not. And the ability to use Google now to organize my life, or and organize to organize my life, I'm happy with because it makes my life easier. Yeah, it's a it's it's a very uh, complex uh, it's a very complex one, Mike. It really is. Um, the I, I think we, we we all have different levels of comfort with the amount of data we're willing to give, and I think some of that is probably age-related. Uh, young young Chris there is. Uh... <laughs> I have more gray hair than you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you have more hair than me anyway. Um... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think I think the uh, generation selfie uh, are, are willing to give up a lot more uh, in, information than, than than the three of us old, well, the two of us old fogies and Chris. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, so so some of it is age related, but some of it is is you know personality as well, uh, and and maybe context sensitive too. Um, you know. I don't know. I don't know what what the answer well, to that is. Really, well, I, I was having that conversation over over a beer um, yeah. recently, and and um, you know, one question I, I I just ponder quite a bit is is okay. So our generation, you Tom and I, yeah, we're the old fogies, and <laughs> we can't rewire at this point. But but when you look at the generation, say of of our own kids, or or even beyond that, and and. In one sense, there are all these encroachments, quote encroachments, into our privacy. The flip side is the ability, perhaps, to adapt and be a step or two ahead of those encroachments. That that's beyond our ability to to, to even imagine that. Right. Uh, you know, who knows what will evolve? What kind of mechanisms or tools or technologies PGP evolved as a response to just that? What 20 years ago? I don't even know when Phil Zimmerman came up with that, but. Wasn't it in the early seventies? Was it was it that early? Way back, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was I think. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. we we've we've a few more stories we'll, and we're well over time, but we'll try and throw a couple more in because there is actually a bit of a segue here. Uh because we've been talking about privacy, and I think this is an interesting uh aspect to that that we haven't even talked about. And th there's a couple of related stories here that I'm gonna bring up. There's this one about how Apple Pay is you know really taking off uh, in the US and I say in the US I, I make that specific because Apple Pay hasn't been launched anywhere outside of the US yet that I'm aware of but there's you know a huge uh, number of companies have signed up for Apple Pay now uh, so I, I think uh, I saw a figure like 90 percent of, of, of places now are, are able to accept Apple Pay I don't know how 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 valid that is or maybe I misread something but anyway it's available uh, you know, in, in a huge number of places in the US. Uh, and then I saw this story that Samsung, and, you know, this is no big surprise, I suppose, being that yeah. they're Apple's, you know, significant um, competitor in terms of handsets. They're thinking or they're coming up with an Apple Pay competitor. And then this story that Google Wallet, uh, which is another, you know, uh, Apple Pay competitor uh, from, from Google, uh, is can now 
work on iOS uh, and on iOS. Uh, it can split your tab between friends and it can work with Touch ID, two things it couldn't do before. So uh, mobile payments, uh, which have been there for quite a while using NFC and using the likes of Google Wallet. Google Wallet's been out, I think, nearly two years, uh, but never really got significant traction until Apple Pay came out. And the, the difference between Google Wallet and Apple Pay was that Google put them, uh, positioned themselves as a competitor to banks, whereas Apple did the opposite. They went in and partnered with all the banks ahead of time. Uh, and that kind of rising tide that is lifting all the other boats as well. And we're seeing Samsung coming out as a result. So where I'm going with this is that mobile payments now, the ability to pay with a mobile device now is finally becoming a reality. Yeah. This has got to have privacy implications because you know we, we came into this from the privacy side of things. Uh, you know, do you want Apple to know what it is you're buying or Google to know what it is you're buying. Now there's a walled garden there. They, they say that they, they, they won't know. But will, will they know? And would you be comfortable with you know, buying stuff off your mobile? That's a good question. I, I'm on the <laughs> fence about that big time. <laughs> You're talking about a guy who uh, was one of the, the early uh, post-university users of Facebook and, and two years ago closed his Facebook account partly for those reasons. So, <laughs> and, and I don't miss it, <laughs> surprisingly. Uh, so it's a tough question. But uh, you know, um, here in the US, despite uh, years and years, and it's heading that way, um, of checks, paper checks going away. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you've been way, way ahead. Uh, back in the 80s when I was living in Europe, in France, uh, it, everything was already m pretty much electronic in Japan. Uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, acceptance will happen different parts of the world, perhaps, or different demographics more quickly than others. Yeah. I'm curious if you have any sense, Tom or Chris, of, of where it has taken root with Apple Pay. Um, so far, or is it right across the board, across well, it, uh, it, age and demographics? Oh, age and, age and demographics? I don't know, um, because, I, because I haven't seen anyone report that information. Uh, mm -hmm. But ge geogra geographically, it's, it's only out in the US for now. So in that sense, uh, that, that's the only, that's the test bed right now. Mm -hmm. um, Given, given that people who buy Apple Kit tend to be at the higher end of the earnings um, scale, uh, that, that it's a skewed demographic that way. Yeah. Uh, what, what would be interesting to see would be across both Google Wallet and Apple Pay, a breakdown of who uses it by by age, yeah, by, by demographic. That, that would yeah. be a fascinating one to look at because... That would be, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's skewed as well because people who who can use that are people who have bought recent high-end smartphones. Yeah. Uh, so that that tends to skew it a bit anyway. So th these are generally tech-savvy people at the higher end of the earnings uh, um, scale. Uh, so yeah, I. I don't well, know the age. That out. I find it. I find it interesting from point of view. We actually we, we don't know the level of detail on what is actually being recorded by Apple Pay in terms of what you actually buy. You know, and, and well, they, they 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 have written about that and they said that they don't know anything about it. All right, so 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 they don't know at a line item level what I've actually purchased. It's just at a value level. Yeah. How they, so. Well, that, that, that actually makes me slightly less concerned. But, it's but I, I don't know if Google is in the same boat. Yeah. Maybe they are. Um, but on, on, as against that, the other side of that is that uh, if you're using a Visa card or a MasterCard or an Amex or whatever it is, those companies know all your buying habits and where you're buying and when you're buying and all that kind of stuff. And that's something that nobody talks about. But, but the point of it is, is that the... the um, you know, on, on, on my banking app, for example, I can categorize what I buy in terms of lifestyle, restaurants, and things like that there, which I've chosen not to do because it's giving highly structured information about my <laughs> to my bank. So if I go for a mortgage, I don't want my bank to turn around to me and say, excuse me, you eat out four times a week. You're drinking far too much there, Chris. We're not giving you... <laughs> or you're drinking the wrong brand of beer, you know. <laughs> so I, Tom and I have spoken about this before. 
I have a huge fear of indirect use of data, not necessarily the direct use of data. Um, and handing highly structured information to companies with very little transparency scares the Jesus out of me. So this is one of those things that um, I, I'm not adverse to, to, to Apple and Apple Pay and things like that. Um, I, I, you know, we've trusted them with credit card information for a very, very long time, and they have proven to be a very, uh, or a very uh, good custodian of that information. So I, I'm happy enough to use them the same way I use a credit card. Mm -hmm. It's just what the thing about it is: they are not a financial institution. What policy, what compliance and controls do they have to undertake in terms of data that they share with outside organisations that Visa, Mastercard, and American Express? have to comply with? Is it the same? Is it different? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I've said this on, on, on this show before as well. Uh, if I'm faced with a choice between handing information uh, like that to Apple or to Google, which one am I going to trust more with that data? Uh, well, you know, uh, yeah. it's very much in Google's interest to use my data. It's very much in Apple's interest not to use my data. Yeah. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. You know. Google is an advertising currently an advertising company, so the more data it has, the more targeted it can be towards you. Whereas Apple yeah. is a product and software company. I'm sure people will correct me in that at some point, but <laughs> that, that's how I see it at the moment. I'm do, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do one last story and then we're out because we've gone way over time. Uh, but this this last story I thought was fascinating. <clears throat> And it, it, it speaks to technology in an enormous way and, and the kinds of strides we've made uh, in, in, in the, the, the few decades that we've been involved in, in, in space. Uh, and I think this is incredible. Uh, we, we, we sent a, a, a space probe, it's not a spaceship, we, spent a, we, sent a, we, we sent a probe into space nine years ago almost. It's traveled 3,000 million, that's three American billion miles, uh, to reach its primary target, which it, and it's called New Horizons. Uh, the target is Pluto. So it's going to, it, it came out of hibernation after nearly three years on the 6th of December. It is going to head into orbit around Pluto and it's going to start sending back images from Pluto starting around next May, uh, May, June, July. Um, these will be the first time in history that we will have any images of any resolution uh, of Pluto. And any images we have right now are just kind of gray, cloudy things that have been taken from three billion miles away. Um, you know, with the likes of the Hubble. Uh, but now we'll have a, a probe orbiting around it, uh, you know, and the images we'll get will be incredible. And you've you got to imagine the New Horizons uh, uh, probe when it woke up on the 6th of December going, hang on, Pluto's not a planet anymore? What the hell? I went to sleep. I woke up. <laughs> They launched it in 2006. Um, 2006, it was the it was the priority, or it was no longer a planet. So you, the, the mission planners were sitting there thinking, "Whoa, we got that launch just in time." <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, look, look, uh, look, think about it. This thing has been going through space. It has been encountering solar winds and all the rest of it for the last nine years, and they woke this thing up. Now that is. Stunning and amazing in its own right. Yeah. You know that 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 is engineering at its absolute best. You it's brilliant, isn't it? I, I it, it it blows it me. Really is. That, that and landing on the comet. I mean, I know they didn't quite get that right, but just the fact that they could get in orbit around a comet, which is traveling at I don't know how many hundred thousand miles an hour or whatever that the the, the comet is traveling at. Maybe it's fifty thousand miles an hour. I seem to remember, but you know. Launching it several years ahead of time, yeah. and having it having it get into into orbit around a comet and then landing. Okay, not not landing didn't quite go according to plan, but still landing a a, a lander on a comet traveling at like fifty thousand miles an hour or so, yeah. phenomenal. And then getting this one after nine years 
out into uh, orbit around Pluto. Amazing, amazing. Three billion miles away, it you know blows my mind. It really does. Yeah, yeah. That that that, that is that that is a brilliant story. That yeah. is a brilliant story. So. Uh, All right. I think on that. Yep. We'll call it a show. Works for me. So, Mike, Chris, thanks a million guys for coming on. It's been great. Uh, Likewise. Thank you, Tom. We, we we ran well over, and we're going to blame the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a t-shirt with that on. I'm going to blame the new guy. <laughs> Hashtag blame the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's, uh, next week is Christmas week, and the week after I may be hungover. So last time we did that in Las Vegas? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was fun, actually. That was. That was. That... Maybe we should do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. Uh, I'm not even sure what date is going to be in two weeks' time. Do we, would it be? Uh, that'll be the. Let me just pull it up here. That'll I should know that ahead of time. Shouldn't I? Second of January. The second of January. The second. Be, should definitely be, be hungover. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, Mike, Tom, and having me again. Likewise, no problem, guy. No problem, uh, Chris. No problem, Mike. We'll uh, we'll we'll be back in a few weeks with somebody on the show talking about something at some point. <laughs> Have a good Christmas and New Year, and uh, we'll we'll see you on the other side.